<clears throat> well, this morning, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be talking about Independence Day. You know, it is Thursday. We're not going to meet again before, or I won't meet again before then, so I thought that I would just share some thoughts about Independence Day. And part one of this is entitled, The Founding Father's Conviction. The Declaration of Independence on 4 July 1776. I just happened to have a very cool little document that I happened to get from the Eaton County Tea Party Patriots that magically appeared in my mailbox one day. This is a pretty remarkable little document. It has the Declaration of Independence in it and also the Constitution. Hence, I have this information. So I read through the <clears throat> Declaration of Independence, and most of the document lists over 25 grievances that the colonies had with the King of England and how all their attempts to solve these problems peacefully were rejected. The men who represented the 13 colonies were normal, average, ordinary citizens just like us today, but they had reached a point where enough was enough. The final paragraph in the Declaration of Independence reads as follows. It's a little long, so bear with me. <clears throat> it says, we therefore, the representatives of the United States of America, and the United is small case because they didn't mean to call it the United States, which we ended up being, but at that time they were just saying that they were united and the states in America, in general Congress, assembled, appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do, in the name and by authority, of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are, and of right, ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved, and that, as free and independent states, they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Fifty-six men signed this document, knowing full well that the King of England was going to send his army to put down this insurrection and hang them all for treason against the crown. But the thing that I thought was most important out of this was that their mutual conviction and their willingness to pledge their lives, fortunes, and personal honor to one another by signing the document. It was because of their conviction Regardless of the outcome, I mean, there was no guarantee that everything was going to work out to their favor. It was a battle. That regardless of the outcome, regardless of the cost to them and their families, it was because of their conviction that they accomplished what they did. Just think about, for a moment, the men who signed this document. How do you imagine their wives and families felt when they came home that day and said, Hey, honey. Guess what? I just committed treason against the king of England, and he is going to be mad at us. He's probably going to take everything that we own, and I'm probably going to get hung. Oh, way to go, honey. <laughs> Hello? Talk about a step of faith. A step of faith. Now, I wonder how many people actually stop and think about this for a moment. You know, we celebrate July 4th, but do we realize 
that the celebration is not about winning the Revolutionary War. The celebration is about the Declaration. You know, the war actually started before the Declaration was made. And the war went on for a long time after. As a matter of fact, the war actually started on April 19th of 1775 in the battles of Lexington and Concord and did not officially end over six years later on September 3rd, 1783, when the Treaty of Paris was signed. We celebrate the Declaration of Independence. We celebrate those 56 men who put their lives on the line when they signed that document. We don't celebrate the the winning of the Revolutionary War. That was good news. I mean, it was actually a long, protracted kind of thing when you read the history of it because the treaty had to be sent back to each country and had to be ratified by each country that was involved in You know, we had allies. But the 4th of July celebrates the boldness, the conviction, and the courage of the 56 men who put their names on that document and took this country into a new direction, took the colonies into becoming a nation. So if you hadn't thought about that in a while, that's what that's all about. So these men had great conviction. What about Christian conviction, our conviction? You know, when these men signed that document, they were basically declaring that they were going to be free of the bondage that the king of England was putting upon them and all the rest of the people that lived in the colonies. They were throwing the shackles off saying, we're not taking it anymore, we're done. How about when Christians throw off the oppression and the bondage of the ruler of this world. When we heard and submitted ourselves to the instruction of King Jesus to be immersed in water, to be cleansed of our past sins, and to receive the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, we declared we were ready to fight. We were ready to sacrifice all that we had. We were ready to give up our very lives for the new king of our lives, Jesus, the Son of God. It was a declaration of war against Satan. Didn't think about that, huh? Yep. It seemed so easy at first, getting right with God, getting all your past sins taken care of, begin walking in a new life. It seemed so simple at first. And then, ding, 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 the rounds start coming downrange. You're going, hey, wait a minute. I'm not sure I was ready for that. Well, you declared war against Satan when you did that. You said you were going to have a new king. You were no longer going to be in subjection to him. John 3, 5, Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And that's what happened when we were born again. We have a new king. We have a new allegiance. We have a new set of rules and regulations that we're to follow to please the king. 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Turn with me to Romans chapter 6. Because we've had our Independence Day. We may not have sent bottle rockets up in the sky on that day, probably should have. You know, I personally can't actually remember the day that I was immersed for the second time. I know it was in the month of May. I can't remember the day, but that's not that important. Romans 6 and 4. Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. For if we've been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him and the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. 
Yeah, one time we were slaves to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. But now we got this new life with a new king and a new hope through Jesus our Lord. If you've been born of the water and the spirit, you've, been, you've already had the ultimate Independence Day. And along, along the way, you've probably run into some trials and tribulations, but that's good. It's just like our forefathers did. They had battles to be fought. And remember, that battle, that Revolutionary War battle went on and on and on. Yep, we had some pretty smart founding fathers, though, and they were able to overcome against the greatest army that was on the face of the planet of the time. And a bunch of old farmers with muskets were able to rally together because they had conviction and they were able to overcome. Ignore that. But the king of this earth was not going to let us waltz away without some sort of a fight. That's why Paul reminds Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.10. He says, but you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution." It is a battle that we all have to fight. Christian conviction comes with a price. You know, for many years we've enjoyed peace and harmony, basically, in this country of ours. But that may be coming to an end. As I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, the decline of morals in our country is like a roller coaster coming down the hill at a high rate of speed. Anybody who gets in its way is going to be flattened. I am somewhat disappointed, but it doesn't surprise me that the media has gone so far in their reporting on what they call the death of Doma. Doma was that law that was passed, Defense of Marriage Act, D-O-M-A, Defense of Marriage Act. And the news media is pumping that thing up like this is the greatest thing that's happened since peanut butter and sliced bread. And it makes you wonder, where's all the Christians on the face of the planet? Where are they? How come we're not getting heard? As Christians, we have the word of God to guide us as to what the standard of right and wrong, good and evil is. And that's being challenged each and every day. It is not a matter of being open-minded or having a superior intellect. It is a matter of standing with God or not. Standing with God or not. Jesus said in Matthew 12 and 30, He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. We each need to evaluate our personal conviction regarding our walk with King Jesus. Where do we stand? Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, picking up in about verse 32. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. 
He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Can you see that standing on the word of God regarding morals is confessing Jesus before men? Can you see that not doing so, you are denying Christ in your life? Christian conviction will make you different from the world and therefore a target of ridicule and persecution. But Christians are not supposed to be punching bags either. We've been called to be war fighters. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Starting in about verse 1. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Convicted Christians are to be committing to other faithful men the teachings of Christ and the apostles. And those teachings include the morals of the scriptures. And they are under attack. Remember I said a couple of weeks ago, there's three things that you can do. You can reject them and rebuke them. You can remain silent or you can agree with them. And sometimes in remaining silent, people think you agree with them. Have you given any thought to what might be next? What might be next? You don't think that Satan is done, do you? Well, I've sort of pondered this, not in great depth. But if they're going to start changing the federal laws, and, you know, and maybe part of it has to do with the benefits. Because I was thinking, why the big issue? Why has this become such a, an issue? I think partly is money. After this past one individual that apparently uh, had been married to another person, that person had died and received a bunch of inheritance from her partner. And because it was not a spouse, the, um, how do I want to say, it? The, the tax laws are much different, you know, for a friend as opposed to a family member. And this person ended up paying over $300,000 in taxes that, oh, well, if the federal government had only recognized this as being married, I would have had $300,000 more. So maybe that's the real issue. I'm not positive sure. And it's kind of almost overwhelming. But I'm concerned about what's next. What comes next? If they can change these kind of rules, can they start forcing things on churches? We were pretty particular when we put together the bylaws of this assembly. But if the federal government declares all those things invalid, well, maybe the rules are going to change. Or if we don't sign some sort of document that says we embrace all people of all faiths and in all marriage perceptions, that we would lose our... Uh, 503, whatever it is. Thank you. If we lost our, our, our tax benefit, if we don't sign some sort of document, I mean, is that next? And if that would happen, I think we'd end up closing the doors. More on that in a minute. So you can reject them, you can rebuke them, you can remain silent, which may be dangerous, or you can agree with them. Maybe it could be something as simple as God says it's a sin and I agree with God and leave it at that. But I have a sidebar on that particular scripture that we looked at just a moment ago. <clears throat> Verse 4. 2 Timothy 2 4. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And you know, I look at this particular thing as maybe one of those affairs of this life. And I get, you know, 
how involved should we get in this? Because it really is, you know, the affairs of this nation. You know, what's happening here? I mean, I suppose we could all find a new place to live and pack up and move there. But how entangled can we get in the affairs of this life? And it's a fine line that we have to walk. Because there's many good things or worthy things that we can get involved with. And maybe we feel guilty because we don't do enough. There's so much we could do, but is it the most profitable thing that we could do? Could, you know, should we be fighting, you know, to reinstate DOMA? I mean, is it, is it that important? But there's other things that are good that maybe we should be involved in. This thing with Sandra and this blind lady. Okay, well, that's eight to ten weeks, maybe twelve. That, that could be a good thing. And that's just being good stewards to our neighbors. But what about a jail ministry? Some of you may remember we actually got involved in jail ministry with Eaton County Jail many years ago. It didn't turn out too profitable. But at the time, it seemed like a good thing to do. It seemed like the door was opening that we should step through, and it just didn't work out very well at all. The other day, uh, they were... Some, somebody was sitting on a roof for the Haven arrest. If I got that all messed up, I apologize. I heard it on the radio. Apparently they were doing some sitting on a roof trying to raise money for the Haven arrest. Well, is that a good thing to get involved in? How about single moms? Or maybe pro-life? Don't get me going. The Christian Motorcycle Association. The American Legion. How about the VFW? Food banks. Tom stepped out of the room. Helping the homeless. Helping wounded veterans. Working with people at the VA hospital. Working maybe with pro-marriage. Working against this DOMA thing. How about removing humanism from schools or adding God back into the schools? There's a fine line of things that we can get involved in that could consume all your time and energies. There's no doubt about it. I've tried to evaluate my participation in any of these things with a couple of scriptures. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. That's Matthew 6 and 33. Mark 16, 15, and he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Matthew 28, 19, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. James 1.27, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Let's say for a moment you've evaluated the opportunity that's come your way, and it seems to be in line with what God would have you to do, and it maybe it's right up your skill set. It's something that you work with all the time, and you know you're going to be very good at doing whatever it is. Colossians 3.23. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. keeping those things in focus when you make that choice to get involved. And I only brought that up because, you know, I've been sort of rabble-rousing on this whole uh, marriage issue. And I don't want you to get the impression that I'm telling you all that you should go out there and, you know, stand on the street corner with placards in Leviticus 20 or whatever. No, I'm not asking you to do that. And so that's why I brought this up. I want you to consciously look at your skill set, your availability, keeping these scriptures in mind. Will this ministry that you're getting involved in do these things as God would have you to do? And then do it heartily. That's all. What to do now? Because remember, we're talking about Christian conviction. We're talking about the conviction that the founding fathers had, how they willingly went out on a limb, When we became Christians, we basically did the same thing. We declared our independence from the things of this world. And if you've been sort of skating along and, you know, bobbing along, I'm telling you, storm's coming. Get ready for it. 
2 Corinthians 13, 5 says, examine yourselves as to whether you're in the faith. And the next thing it says to do, it says, test yourselves. Maybe start with evaluating your personal conviction. You need to ask yourself some tough questions to see how far you're willing to go to stand up for the word of God. So here's something to consider. If the leadership of this church all died at once, would you just choose the most convenient place to assemble, or would you go as far as needed to assemble with brethren who believe all scriptures given by the inspiration of God? In my youth, I was tested in that particular area several times. It was 45 minutes on the freeway in California, one way, to get to the one church of Christ that my brother thought would be worthy for me to assemble as, as a young Christian. I got grief for that (laughs) every week. I went on Wednesday nights. After I had driven an hour and a half from El Toro back up to where we live to pick up Linda to get her to jump in the car, we'd drive another hour to get up there to the, to the church. How far would you go to assemble with the brethren if there was no place else to go? If we had to close the doors because we didn't have enough money coming in to keep the lights on, what would you do? Well, there's another question, and that's getting to be a real reality. I don't know if you've been looking in the bulletin, but things are getting pretty thin. Look at the seats. The seats are pretty empty. It's summertime. People have things going on. Not everybody's here. But people are also making the decision to find other places that are closer, that are uh, less strict, less rigid, looking for more touchy, warm, feely, fuzzy feelings, I'm not sure what. But if we can't keep the lights on, will you dig deeper or will you just go find someplace else to assemble? If the government closed our doors because of our preaching or doctrine, what would you do? Where would you go? Find like-minded brethren and go assemble in their houses? Or go someplace that isn't persecuted by the government. Is your faith and walk with the Lord your personal faith? Is it your personal conviction? Or is it strongly tied to someone else? If they stopped assembling, would you? This is about your personal walk and your personal conviction. Are you here because somebody else is here? Or are you here because you're have a personal walk with the Lord and a personal conviction to gather with like-minded saints on the first day of the week to participate in this memorial feast which we've already done. Is your conviction causing you to defend the word of God now? If so, praise the Lord. If not, why not? Like I said a moment ago, I'm not asking you to go to a gay pride rally with a bullhorn quoting Leviticus 20 and 13. But what about a family member that makes the announcement that he or she is glad that the Defense of Marriage Act was overturned? Family member, what do you say? Would you be bold enough to say, I'm not. God says it's a sin and I agree with God. If a coworker or friend begins talking about what a terrible mess this country is in, you could say something like, It was bound to happen. When we kicked God out of the schools and government, the country was bound to slide into depravity. What else might you do to reinforce your conviction? To increase your personal faith? By looking into the scriptures for the answers to the current social issues and the things that people are talking about at work. Look carefully in the Old Testament and read how God used individuals to restore the nation of Israel when they got off the path. Most of them only had one thing to offer, a willing heart, and God did the rest. Make sure you have a godly opinion on the issue and not a man-made one. 
Remember what Jesus said. If you're not gathering with him, you're scattering. 2 Timothy 2.15, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be shamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. In this dark and dreary world, people are looking for some leadership. Looking for someone or something with a strong conviction or purpose that they can be a part of. The stronger your faith, the stronger your conviction, the more attractive you are to those who are looking for hope. But if you're just as wishy-washy as everybody else where you work, what would be attractive to you or to them? The founding fathers had a strong opinion and a strong conviction on what needed to be done to right a wrong. Actually, there's many wrongs. 237 years ago, 56 men stepped out in faith and conviction to sign a document that led to the creation of the United States of America. Yes, we got issues. And the future of this country may be in doubt. But remember, God is still in control. And he knows what a few convicted Christians are capable of accomplishing with his help. So that's my encouragement to you this week. Independence Day is right around the corner. People are going to be cooking up some hot dogs and barbecue and hanging out and working on their suntans. But see if you can stop and remember the personal conviction that those men displayed when they signed that document. And remember that Christians are to have a strong conviction also. We serve the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and we are his representatives here on the face of this planet. Let us act like it and let's demonstrate that we believe it by the things that we say and do to those who live around us. Thanks for your attention. Let's stand and be dismissed with a word of prayer. Brother Frank.